you so much to Keynote Our Kunst and uh, Louis Vuitton for the invitation. And we're actually going to do this in, um, in English. Maybe other languages we'll enter later, but we're going to start it in English. Um, and maybe by, to begin with the beginning, this is not the, you know, the first time we record a conversation, but I thought, because it is the first time we you know, actually do a public conversation in Munich, it would be very nice to maybe begin with the beginning, um, so that everybody can somehow know where you started. And you, what I know is that you always drew already as a child, that there was this, as it still continues every day, this practice of you to draw. And can you maybe tell us about these very beginnings? There was also your family at a certain moment moved to Saudi Arabia. I think that was an important thing. So yeah, let's begin with the beginnings. Yes, okay, so first of all, thank you so much for this beautiful invitation and this nice evening. Um, yes, okay, actually I, I grew up in, in Saudi Arabia in Mecca. Uh, but my father decided that he doesn't want me really to lose all my connection, not me, I mean the family, or all our connection to, to Egypt. So we spent uh, half of the year in, in Mecca and half of the year in Alexandria. That was happening for almost nine years of my childhood. Uh, but Mecca also was really affecting me enough, so I can see all these religious topics are embedded and taking big part of my work till now. Um, and uh, also maybe later we can speak more about many of the, of the content of the work that I'm, I'm using, uh, the, the topic of, of uh, uh, the society is uh, transforming from one system to another system, because also I lived this as a child. It was very noticeable, it was very clear as a kid to see a nomadic Bedouin society is moving from this system to very modernized uh, system, which is more American, of course. Yeah. So, uh, and when you started, uh, you know, growing up in Egypt and spending also time in Saudi Arabia, what was the first museum you visited as a child? Do you remember sort of your first contact with art, your first contact with the museum? Yeah, no, I, I think, of course, I mean, I visited, the first thing was in, in, in Egypt, the Museum of Modern Art in Egypt. Uh, but the first uh, international European museum was uh, Rina Sophia. I was almost 18. And uh, can you tell us about these, uh, maybe, influences or, or sort of heroes? Because when we, when we spoke last time, we had, you know, long conversations on Somehow, artists who inspired you, maybe from the past, you mentioned Hamid Nader, you mentioned Al Ghazal, and obviously later it was also Western influences. But I think it could be very interesting to hear about these you know, influences from the beginning and to talk more about Hamid and, and Al Ghazal and what inspired you from yeah. their work. They're more surreal, actually. And uh, this, these are the, the two uh, Egyptian artists that I was really fascinated by. But during my, uh, my study in the Faculty of Fine Arts in Alexandria, I was actually really, really connected uh, to the German artists. And then there's a reason for this, because my uh, professor uh, studied in Dusseldorf uh, under uh, Guthard Grabner. So the idea of Dusseldorf Academy for me was like really fascinating. I was really, I, I, I think I was totally uh, uh, almost uh, studying Joseph Boys and um, it affected a lot of the work that came later. And many other arts, awesome. Gerhard Richter was also a very, very important figure to me during my studying period in, in, in Alexandria. Um, yeah. But that's fascinating because I also, when I was at high school, you know, Joseph Beuys came to the Bodensee and he kind of gave a speech in Rorschach and it kind of had an impact on me as well. I might have been something like 18 when that happened. Uh, and so, what was it about Beuys? Was it sort of the idea of social sculpture or what was it which fascinated you? And how, how did you, what kind of information did you have in Egypt at that time as a student? Was it books or what? Books, of yeah. course, yeah. Back then, there was like no anything, like no computers, no internet, no. Mobiles, nothing. But anyway, it was yeah, it was books. We had only uh, three libraries, main, like main libraries. One belonging to the American Cultural Center, and one to Goethe Institute, 
and the other one is the British Cultural Center. That's it in Alexandria. So we used whatever, whatever there. But it was uh, for 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 Joseph Boys actually. It was for me. Uh, it was so uh, connected connected to my religious thoughts. I had always this idea that he is uh, using um, the material in in a religious way, where you have to believe in its chemical content. So you can, and this this chemical content is the reflection for the conceptual references, and I feel that this is very connected to many of the work that I'm 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 trying to do, actually. Now it's uh, interesting also in in terms of you know your beginnings uh, because you mentioned Gerhard Richter. Uh, one of the things um, which Gerhard Richter defined very very early in his oeuvre is actually um, the beginning you know of the catalogue raisonné. He sort of started to number very early on. You know, in the 60s, the catalogue raisonné and you know, declared the first, the number one in the catalogue raisonné, the famous table, which is you know, uh, for, you know, first the beginning of the photo painting in his work. And I was sort of wondering of the blurred photo painting. I was kind of wondering um, for you the beginning of your catalogue raisonné, because here you are, you know, in Egypt you study, uh, you make lots of lots of drawings, and as far as I understand, it was somehow in '96 that you started then to kind of compress all these experiences into installations. Can you tell us about the number one in your catalog raisonné? Yeah, I think the number one was uh, uh, an installation called Frozen Nubia. And uh, so uh, Nubia is a culture that almost, I cannot say disappeared, but it's uh, Upper Egypt. It's a loca located in Upper Egypt, and it takes part of Sudan as well. Uh, after building the high dam in Egypt, and that was in '64 during the Nasser period, um, that the water flooded, and that had to move all the the the, the people from Nubia from one location to another location. I was fascinated how can you almost erase a culture by moving them a few miles. It was almost a few miles, that's true, just from one location to another location. They used to be very productive, uh, self-sufficient society, and after this movement, they just lost everything. Agriculture, lands, they became consumerists because, because it's just different land. Uh, yeah, so that was... Uh, uh, I was, I think, it was about maybe 24 or something. Because when I started this research, I, th I find it still. Of course, when I look at it, it's, it was premature, but it was uh, the beginning. But it, and it has a lot of uh, of thoughts coming from uh, from boys during this time. And there is also an architectural thing from the beginning in this installation because you were interested in, and that's something which I think is interesting maybe to emphasize in this interview today because many people are now familiar with your films, but you know, you still do installations now. And at the very beginning, it was installation. I was wondering for these spaces which you built, and you then later in the 90s used asphalt and tile uh, and concrete and built this, you know, rather makeshift kind of architecture into the space. Was there an inspiration from architecture? Because the first time you know we visited Egypt, I was very uh, sort of amazed by how important Hassan Fatih is mm -hmm. and this whole idea of architecture of poverty. You know how one can actually do amazing architecture with very poor materials. And I was wondering if Hassan Fatih was an inspiration, or if you drew from other kind of inspirations from the world of architecture. I think yeah, Hassan Fatih. I think is a, is a is a great figure. Actually, I was very lucky to to be presented with him in Venice Biennale 2003, in the same pavilion. Um, yeah, but I, I think what, uh, what is, it was maybe a little bit connected also in the, in the architectural thoughts when I was building the frozen Nubia installation in, in, in 96. Yeah, but back to the idea of an installation, I think I'm more into installation, much even more than videos, although most of what I'm doing now is videos. Um, but I always feel that it's much better for me to, to create an installation that been, that, and then I film the installation after that. And uh, even for, the, for many of the ideas that I worked with uh, in many different series, like Telematch series, for example, it's more like uh, I create uh, a fake um, 
performance, it's fictional performance, and then I document it. So it's usually different uh, mediums are mixed together to, to construct the film. And this mix, uh, you mentioned the mix, I mean there's the mix of video and installation. Obviously at the very beginning it's installation without film and then you moved to the US in 1999 and had this experience of going you know, to a temporary exile in the US to emigrate and I was kind of wondering when did you have the epiphany to kind of combine you know, film, filmic work and installation? What was the first work where this, where this started? The first work that it had videos with installation was called CD Al Asfal Smulit. If we want to translate this, it will be the birth, the day, the day of birth of Saint Asphalt. Um, it's an installation that, first of all, that the Mulid is is um, is the day of birth that is uh, is really really something very traditional in Egypt, and it goes back to the Fatimid period in Egypt when when Egypt was controlled by the Fatimid. And what is happening there that they celebrate the, the birth of the Prophet Muhammad. But not just the Prophet Muhammad, you have different members of the family of the Prophet in each, for each member of the family they have a different celebration. So that's why officially in Egypt you have over 360 uh, official mulids, beside others of course. So it goes, it just goes until you maybe you reach something like a crazy man in a village, he died somewhere, and then they believe that this man is, uh, he has that supernatural natural power, and then they start to go, uh, I don't want to say pray for him, but they believe that if they ask him after death for something, they will get back what they ask for. So I was working a bit about this uh, topic, about mulids in Egypt, because it presents a specific system also happening in Egypt, that was the original, before the immigration that happened in the 70s. I just want to say this very quickly. In the 70s, during President Sadat, many families, inclu including mine, immigrated or went to the Gulf area because of the oil industry. And this, this thing, this immigration thing, although it was just economic for economical reason, but it, it made a huge change in the whole society structure. Before this period, it was known that, for example, there was almost no veiled women in Egypt at all. And after all these people went to Saudi Arabia in the 70s, and they, most of them came back in the mid-80s, now, it's, very, it's hardly to see uh, women not veiled in, in Alexandria or Cairo. This, the, this whole structure, I was really fascinated by this uh, differences that happened because it's, a, it's like a, a new shape of Islam came from Saudi Arabia or, or from, from the uh, nomadic uh, dry land. Uh, and it's, of course, it's more, they call it more Wahhabi. Uh, yeah, uh, so, yeah. So these are the Sadat, uh, the Sadat years, and obviously that's also the time you grew up, but it was the moment yes. uh, of also a bigger proximity Egypt took as opposed to the United States. That was sort yes. of a bigger proximity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of this then appears in your work, talking about Sadat. Maybe we should talk about telematic Sadat, mm -hmm. which is an important work. Can you, can yes. you tell us about how this yes. came about? Yeah. Um, uh, during the... the between 90, um, okay, 2007 and 2009, I made a series called Telematch series. It's based on the journal program, Telematch. I don't know if you, if you remember this program. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a program was very, very famous in, in Saudi Arabia, I don't know why. But it, it's a journal program <laughs> where you have two German towns or two German cities competing. They run in the mud to collect some balls and they, they have points. And, and usually the setup for this uh, uh, contest, it's, it's a contest, uh, the setup is very cliche of European medieval city. You see nice forts, castles. And, 
um, yeah, it was it was really very important during my childhood period also. And uh, the the German program the stopped this uh, this program in the in in, in 1984. Um, okay, so I made a series of films that has that under the the, the, the concept of telematch. So it's called. One is called Telematch Shelter, Telematch Market, Telematch Sadat, and so on. <laughs> so, um, when I, again, when I was a kid, once I came back to Alexandria, I was watching TV and I was watching the parade of uh, Sadat in, that was 1981. And when I, it happened, the assassination of Sadat on TV. So I, I was really aware of this. And I think Sadat is extremely important for my generation in Egypt. Not important in the term of that we really respect him or not. But it's really, as I said, because, because of this transformation that happened, the economic transformation that happened in Egypt during this period, it affected all of us. It made my family leave. Egypt to Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, so uh, the, when I tried to, to translate this assassination of Sadat, I, I, I thought of how to make a reenactment for the assassination by kids. So I made the entire parade and the assassination and the funeral of the president all made again by kids. And kids are very, very important in the series of telematch. Working with kids is because it's very important that the kids don't know Sadat. They don't know the history of this assassination. They don't uh, recall, so they don't act, basically. They don't have the same drama that I have. Uh, I will just tell them, OK, jump from this car to here, go this direction. And they're just following what we're telling them to do. And I find that this is very, very important. Also, that you don't add any sexual or gender layer to the the topic, so it does not become much more complicated. It becomes only about the assassination itself. And you yeah. use obviously of, you collaborate with kids in many other films. Yes. In the you know the Telemash series, but it's also the Asphalt Quarter is uh, where the kids do this an incredible piece where the kids build this asphalt runway. There is a kind of a limited time span, I think, of a day. And I wanted to ask you to tell us about this kind of collaboration with kids, because it's also your connection to, to literature. Because the other day I spoke to Marvan, uh, the, uh, the artist in Berlin, and he was actually telling me about Abdel Rahman Munif and the importance, the incredible importance of this author for the Arabic world. And then I suddenly remembered that's the same author you actually you know, used and who inspired you for this piece, for the Aspar Quarter, with the first chapter out of Cities of Salt. Can you tell us about the genesis of yes. this piece? Abdurrahman Munif is a Saudi Iraqi novelist. Um, he made a really great uh, five books series called Cities of Salt. And it tells the establishment of Saudi Arabia. The first chapter is telling the story about this nomadic, I mean, I cannot say nomadic, it's the, the, the Bedouin, uh, um, very, very uh, uh, simple fishermen that supposedly live in Saudi Arabia. And the beginning of um, the arriving of the British oil company to this village. So he's describing in the first chapter this relationship between these very, very simple Saudis. It was not Saudi Arabia but by then, but it was just these villagers. And arriving for all these European with the white skin and, and the blonde hair, this for them, that was the first time ever they see this. And they did not speak the language, but at the same time, the, the European um, uh, oil industries, um, uh, companies, uh, had to hire them to build platforms for the oil. So they were working with them without knowing really what they're doing, without understanding the language. And for me, that was also fascinating because they, they, it was description for like working for four years in something they didn't even know that they are building their own future, their own history, but they were just following orders. 
And when I when I was trying to translate this uh, this chapter, I went to a village in uh, in Egypt, in the Western Desert, Egypt. I went to the parents. I convinced them uh, that they we about this idea, and we that we need to 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 have uh, over 60 kids with us to to build an asphalt runway in the desert. That was almost a translation for this. So the kids believed in it. We used a, a type of asphalt that does not really require heat. Of course, yeah. And the, the kids really like were playing and they achieved a beautiful, real runway in the desert, thinking that this will be functional. And is the runway still there? I, I, I'm sure it's covered with sand, but this is just the, the, the idea. It was, and so the, the film was just about documenting their, the, the, the progress of, of, of making this asphalt runway. And then kids also play a role in a series which uh, is ongoing, which is La Raba Al Matfuna, which yes. is a, a film you're working on now. You, you just uh, showed actually in the Sharjah Biennial the extraordinary first you know, chapter of it, and you will show at the certain time and later on this year in November we have your solo exhibition, you know, the second chapter. So I was wondering if you can tell us maybe about Al Raba Al Matfuna and what, what triggered this, because what is interesting about this is that it enters more now the work you're doing now. And, and I think one thing which is so fascinating is that you work on this very long-term project. I mean, we're going to talk, of course, later about the Cabaret Crusades, which I think yes. many here are familiar with through, you know, Documenta. But I think it's interesting to start with Rabba and Mafuna because we have the connection to the kids, but also this beginning, really, of yours working longer on something in, in episodes, in chapters. Yes, uh, Al Arab and Mafuna. It's uh, um, over ten years ago. I was. Uh, I mean, dur during my fascination with mulids and all these uh, traditions that are happening in, in Egypt, uh, the Sufi mulids in particular, I knew many people, and one of them, one of my friends, uh, he believes, I don't know, he believes that he's a shaman, sort of a shaman. It's, it's a, it, they call it a different one. They call him sheikh in, uh, in Egypt, like that, like, but there are different uh, uses for this word sheikh. So uh, he believed that he's a shaman, and uh, he told me that he's invited to go to a village in Upper Egypt. It's called Al Arab Al Madfuna, because uh, he wants to heal some people and to see if there are treasures under the ground and, and so on. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it's a big thing in happening in Egypt actually for years, which is the. Uh, um, when, when you try to, to, to find the uh, pharaonic treasures under the ground, of course, because how, how do you think all these treasures went to Europe? I mean, this is happening with them. <laughs> it's not all official, of course. <laughs> this is real. So you have a lot, a lot, a lot of sheikhs all over Upper Egypt that believes that, I, mean, I don't know, maybe this is true. I have no idea, but this is, this is what they claim that they can see under the ground and they know exactly how to lead people to find the right door to reach the, the king chamber. And obviously, they sometimes succeed. Because it's not very, very simple as I'm saying it. It's not just someone is, like, it's obviously, I mean, they say that they connect to certain spirits and mediums and they, they these, the mediums lead them to to open the doors. Okay, anyway, I went there, and I spent some time, it was almost like two weeks in this village, uh, where we were like really welcomed by, by all the village, all the time we had, we were sitting in one room, and all the time people come to this room, they just sit. Basically, the welcoming is just made, sometimes they don't even talk, they just sit, and we eat, and they leave, and they come other people, and they sit, and that's it. That was the, the process. At the same time, in the middle of the room, there was like a hall that was existed for about 20 years, actually. And people like really taking this after like all generations believe in the same thing, that one day, one of the strong sheikhs will come to the village and will find the right way or the right path to find the treasures. Obviously, this is not happening in only my, in this uh, house that I was to, it was happening all, almost in all, most of the houses in this village. And this is happening also because this 
village al Arab al Madfuna is located on the same hill where very very important pharaonic uh, uh, temple exists, which is Siti the Second's temple. Uh, and next to it, the, the city is the second temple, there is something called Ozorion. Something very mysterious. We're not even sure what is it for exactly. It's all made out of granite. Uh, anyway, I, I, I'm, 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 I was, it was a very, very important experience for me to uh, attend these two weeks of many people were supposedly possessed, and this man was like, Try to heal them, and at the same time, a lot of of uh, of uh, working on trying to find the right uh, path is under the ground. We don't see anything, but obviously there are other people in the room seeing things that I don't see. <laughs> so I decided to translate this experience as a society who lives on the ancestors' history. But uh, I, I, so I, for the film of Al Arab Al Madfuna, I made the, the whole film the, the same experience, but uh, with kids again, uh, with, with a room extremely similar to it. I filmed the whole thing in Upper Egypt a year ago. Uh, but I mixed this with a story by uh, an Egyptian novelist. His name is Muhammad Mustajab. He's, he's from Upper Egypt as well. And his writings, I think, fascinating. Is he a contemporary writer? Or? He is, but he died about eight eight years ago. He's not extremely famous. He's not really famous, but I I, I really think that he's he's very very special. His his writings are uh, so visual, so surreal, and you feel at the same time that it's it's real. It's. Uh, it's, is he translated? Because uh, it is translated. after the Rahman Munif is translated, yes, he is also translated. It is translated. It's the, I think it's like Egyptian marquees, for example. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit more about the sort of ongoing adventure now of Al Arava Al Mafruna? Because you're just on the cusp of starting the second chapter, uh, which will be ready in November. And uh, I'm not sure, maybe it's too early, but maybe you can tell us. Yeah, it's too early, but it's also, it will be uh, a continuation for this story uh, that I had in, in another village, and I will mix it with uh, a story again by Muhammad Mustajab. The story, it tells, it's very maybe too, too bad to talk about it now, but it's, anyway, it tells a story by a queen that kills her husband in the, in the wedding day. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's the story. <laughs> yeah, we hope you can all come in long, to London in November and then you will see um, the film. But now, you know, I think it's the moment to talk more about Cabaret Crusade. And as often in your work, I mean, there is this connection to, to literature. We spoke now about Abdel, uh, and Monifi spoke about, you know, the literary connection of al Araba and Atfuna. And this Cabaret Crusade, there is also a connection to literature. And it's uh, Amin Madouf. Yes. Uh, and I've always been very fascinated by the crusade uh, as uh, Ami Malouf describes it, because it's obviously the crusade not from a Western point of view, but it's the crusade from an Eastern point of view. Can you tell us about this book of Malouf and to which extent it connects and inspires your cabaret crusades? Yeah. Um, I, I, I read uh, Amin Malouf after I was already, I decided already that I would make a project about cabaret crusades. And I found that many, many people read it before me, of course. But anyways, this is really embarrassing to say, but this, this is the truth. I read it uh, um, maybe only uh, four years ago. Uh, but the, 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 my, my idea about making a uh, uh, big, huge film series that tells the, the story of the Crusades uh, I had it really long time ago. I didn't just have, I've never had the, the, the means, the, the facilities to, to, to make it. Um, so Amin Ma'louf, in his book, Crusades Through Arab Eyes, he collected many of the Arab historian uh, sayings, phrases, and he constructed all his book around this uh, information. And what I like it a lot about this book, that it's, um, uh, you don't see a lot his uh, 
uh, Amin Malouf's. Uh, uh, you, you still see his opinion through the what he collected, but he never really mentioned bad or good in a, in a very very a very clear way. And I, I really there is something about it very very interesting, for sure. And uh, I, I find it entertaining book sort of. It's not very heavy, because when, when I read the sources, of course, after I started with the book, I went to the sources that he brought, made the book from Ibn Kathir, Ibn Al-Qalansi, Ibn Jubair, uh, writers like uh, uh, Ibn Munqid. For example, Ibn Munqid is an Arab historian, and uh, I have him, uh, he's, he's playing his role, supposedly a marionette playing his role, in um, in the second part of Cabaret Crusades. Ibn Munqid was the, uh, the foreign uh, in, in ambassador of, of Syria. For is this correct? The foreign ambassador? Yes. Foreign, foreign ambassador of Syria, yes. Of Damascus, I'm sorry. Of Damascus. And he was uh, sent uh, by the ruler, the ruler of uh, Damascus to Jerusalem one day to, um, to make negotiations with the Crusades. This is very interesting because he wrote a lot of descriptions from his point of view, how he's also seeing for the first time the Europeans. And these descriptions also are used in many of the songs in the film. Uh, and this relationship between him as an ambassador and uh, uh, him as a, a poet and uh, a writer and um, a historian also is extremely important because part of Amin Malouf's book is based on Ibn Munqid writings. And so far, I've seen our unrealized project to get you and Malouf into a room, you know, to discuss okay. this. We've tried many times. It's so far, it's only happened remotely through technology, but you know, hopefully later this year it will it will happen. Now, your cycle, the three films, uh, is also structured through different geographies because the first part connects a lot to Istanbul. The second part is somehow the path to Cairo, as you told me, yes. and as we could see. And then the third part, which is still unrealized, which is another project you're working on this year, uh, will then lead us to, to Jerusalem. And can you tell us how, how these three chapters somehow unfold and how, how yes. it relates to these different geographies, mm -hmm. these different trajectories, these different paths? Yes. The original plan was to make four films, and now I made them only three. I decided that we, I will make only one film, in, which is I'm working on now, that will be the last one, but it will be a bit longer. Uh, the first film is telling the, the story of only the first four years of the Crusades, which begins from 1095 by the speech of Pope Urban II in Clermont, in France. And it ends with the capturing of Jerusalem by the Crusades in 1099. That's, that's the, the first film. Uh, I, I, I thought it's very important that to make each film completely different from the other. It has its own style, its own marionette music. It has to be completely unique uh, as an art piece. Um, the first part, uh, we managed, not actually me, but it's more like with the help of uh, uh, Michelangelo Pistoletto, the uh, Chita dell'Arte, to convince a very important uh, marionette uh, um, collection museums, very small museum in Torino, to lend us a historical uh, marionette to make the film with it. So it's like 200 years old collection. Uh, that was very, very important to have something really, the beginning of the film was very like, uh, like a real marionette, a Euro European uh, marionette that tells the story of the Crusades through the Arab eyes. It was really, really very nice. Uh, and when you see also, when you hear some people tell me also about this, the idea of how can you make the Pope speaks in classical Arabic, it's very important also because because how you translate all these uh, uh, his, written histories 
um, to make it coming from the Arab point of view. Anyway, the second part. And before we talk about the second yes. part, maybe because you mentioned Pistoletto, yes. and I remember kind of Pistoletto rang me at that time. He said, urgently come to Biella. So you know, we went to yes. Biella and saw saw your exhibition there. And it makes this point you made at the beginning, which is that it's actually not only about the film, but you continue to be an installation artist. You make these installations and uh, you construct spaces. And it was amazing in Biella because it was really a sculptural environment. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think it's very, very important to kind of uh, talk about this, because it's also interesting in the context here of this festival, you know, where it's all uh, so connected to cinema and art, and you know, we saw Isaac Julian earlier, uh, you know, and we had the coffee, and obviously Isaac has for many, many decades now explored how, you know, moving image can be installation, you know, in spaces, which are experiences we could never make in a cinema. And you as well, you know, work a lot on spaces which you construct where we can see the moving images in a very, very different way than we would see them in the cinema. So maybe it's good, before we move on to the second part, yes. that you tell us a little bit about this exhibition in Biela. Yes. It was like a Gesamtkunstwerk. You brought yes. many, many things together. Yes. Uh, even the, the way the, the film was made in the, the first part in Biela, it was more uh, uh, working with the 3D with perspective, and it was... Uh, as I said, it was it was European collection of marionette and also European perspective in the scenography itself. So uh, it was uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean maybe it's a bit uh, difficult to explain this, but um, part of the exhibition also was to make uh, a real scenography similar to the scenography that we used in the film in as part of the of the filming so you have one part you have the screening and the other part of the of the space you have a huge installation that is similar to the the the, the, the scenography we used during the filming and the whole installation is made uh, out of asphalt uh, so it was trying to connect the contemporary that was before the revolution, but this was it was also trying to connect the the contemporary uh, uh, political uh, agenda between the Arab countries and what is also happening uh, in the film. Um, yeah. And that leads us to the past because you say that you know it, it ends then uh, in Jerusalem, but obviously the second part then takes us to Cairo. To the yes. path to Cairo, can you tell us? Yeah, the path to Cairo is tells tells longer time about the Crusades. It's from 1099 to 1146. So it's um, um, also very important period happened in the Middle East because during this period it was already, the Crusades were already in the region. Uh, but you see also the relationship between all the, most of the, of the uh, uh, Muslim leaders in the region and how were they fighting also together and try to protect themselves by uh, making like peace agreement with the Crusaders. And that's, I think, was very, very important point in this film. Uh, it's called The Path to Cairo, although you don't see Cairo in this film at all. But it was the preparation for the third part, where Cairo became the center of these political forces in the region. And this is what's happening in, in this film that uh, I'm, I'm preparing now. Um, there are some figures in this, uh, in this film. Uh, the Path to Cairo are very also important. Someone like Ahmad al-Din Zinki, and then his son, Nur al-Din Zinki. This is what we were talking about earlier, Nur al-Din Zinki. Um, yeah, the path to Cairo, it was a completely different way of working. I decided to make all the marionettes from the scratch and to design them and everything from, from the beginning to end. Uh, not to use existed uh, marionettes, European marionettes. And also, I decided to make the scenography is more into the Arab perspective. So it became more actually flat, more two-dimensional. I used for the scenography um, miniatures that came from, originally came from uh, um, uh, Bosnian 
uh, artist from the 14th century called Nasur. That was the beginning, really. Because this, this artist, he was like really, he was a philosopher, and geographical, and uh, everything, doing everything. But he made beautiful series of plans for Damascus, uh, Istanbul, Aleppo, and I used these plans uh, with the rivers and everything, because supposedly these were real plans from this period. I used them as the scenography for, for each scene we're using. Uh, so it's still having the same um, perspective, the flat two-dimensional uh, perspective. Uh, at the same time, you, you, uh, you don't lose the historical information that they had during this time. It's, the, it's Baghdad. Uh, background. When we have a scene happening in Baghdad, you see the scenography of Baghdad. That you, most of the, the plans that we, we used are coming from this artist, Nasur. Um, and the music. This is the last thing I'll talk about in, in this part. Uh, the music, I also decided to make it because the first film, I we, the music was made in, in uh, for, with an artist from from New York. Uh, developed a bit in in Italy at, as well, um, but the second part I decided to work more with the students from from Oban, from France. But all the music the, the was recorded originally in Bahrain, with a very uh, um, uh, specific traditional. Musicians, they, they they call this type of music Fijeri music. It's the pearl fishing music that it's happening actually in the whole Gulf area. It's not just in Bahrain, but it's supposedly originally created in Bahrain. It goes back to more than 800 years ago. All these drums and this is very the percussions that it's very uh, related to the pearl fishing music. Before we were in the taxi, I was you know asking you the famous Dan Graham question because. Dan always says we can only understand an artist if we can kind of understand what music he or she is listening to. And you were first answering me that you listen comes to everything, but then you specified and said that at the moment you're listening to a, a lot of ancient traditional music from the Gulf. Yes. Uh, and you said that that will also play a role in the third yes. film. Can you tell us about this? Yes, uh, the third film also it will be uh, the Gulf. It's based on the golf music, which is all the pearl fishing music, but I, I would like to use something more, it's, they call it Arda. And this is, that exists more in Saudi Arabia, actually. It's more Bedouin, more uh, uh, dry land music, and uh, uh, very male music, actually. Very, very male music. And it's, I think it's, it's also very important to this, uh, uh, Film. Um, um, yes, for um, and that will be the third part. And and the third part, yes. Yeah, the yeah. third part is much more also complicated. The third part called the secrets. Cabaret Crusades, the secrets of Karbala. And so Karbala is a place, you said. Karbala, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. And then is it too? Because it's similar, you know, because it's such a fascinating moment in your work. Because you will this here to the Alaraba al Mafuna second part and the secrets of Kabbalah, which is the third part of the Cabaret Crusades. And I'm aware that it's difficult for you to obviously talk about what is not made yet, but is there anything you can tell us more about how the third part will work? Because it will be the most complex one yes. of the three ones. Yes. No? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the secrets of Karbala, um, will, it was, uh, ha this, this, this is mainly happening um, during um, uh, the period of uh, begins with someone called Ali ibn Abi Talib. And uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib is uh, the husband of the daughter of the Prophet. So I'm talking about this period, actually. So the film will be having flashback between this time, which goes back to more than 1,000 300 years ago, and it goes back to the time of the crusade, the continuation of the crusades. And I'm trying to connect between the division that happened in the Middle East, the whole Muslim uh, 
countries actually, the division that happened between Shia and Sunnah. So Karbala is a city in Iraq, and where is the, the, a big, big massacre happened between two groups. A group is led by the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Hussein, and another group led by Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Supposedly, a massacre happened. Many, 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 many people died, and these people, big part of them is from the Prophet family. And it's a very, very sensitive topic, and it's very, and that's why there is a division, there, is a, there are things happening sometimes. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a very, it's a, for example, Iran is more Shia, uh, Egypt is more, now is more Sunnah. But one day, Egypt was Shia under the Fatimid period rule, ruling. Uh, so in the third part, what, what you see is the, the changing that, it, that happened in Cairo from Shia system to Sunnah system. And uh, I think this is very, very important topic today. Yeah, exactly. I just want to say that's also where it connects to politics of the 20th yes, century. Yes, right? yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I find it really interesting that I did not mean to do any of this before the revolution, really. It was just all this, uh, the, the series was, was prepared. And then the, 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 the uprising happened. And then it becoming like makes more sense, but I really did not mean it to. to I try not to connect it at all with what's happening today, for sure. Maybe it was a pre, a pre, a pre sentiment. But I mean, you you mentioned the revolution. I think I mean one thing I wanted to ask you also is how you you know experienced the uprising of the revolution, because obviously many of the things we heard, we read, many testimonials we got, you know, here about the revolution had all to do with with Cairo, but you experienced it in, you know, in Alexandria. Can you tell us about yes. your, your memories and your experience? Well, it was great in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and now, I mean, we're still optimistic. We think it will, we will fight till the end, but I don't know exactly what is, I mean, what's happening now is, is a failure, for sure, but it's, um, yeah. We were expecting much, much, much better than this. And it was really great, uh, I think, uh, month of, uh, of uprising. What, what is happening now, maybe what's happening now is, is the reality. It's just uh, this is how revolutions happen. It has to be bad in the beginning, and I hope. But you now, you know, left Egypt, you still do a lot of your work in Egypt, even if you have residencies, you've worked a lot, you know, abroad on residencies. Yes, you yes. always go back for production of works, yeah. more, and you obviously have your school, and I mean, one of the things, you know, when Pistoletto rang me, and then we visited Biella, and went to see Pistoletto's school, and saw your exhibition, one of the things which I also thought was so fascinating is this parallel between you having a school and Pistoletto having a school, because he obviously has this school in Biella, where he teaches and at the same time produces work and does exhibitions. Um, and you have your school in, in Egypt. Uh, can you tell us how your school works and uh, to which is that maybe differs from Pistoletto? Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a school, yeah. it's an educational program. So uh, it's, it was originally my studio. I was lucky one day to have a really big studio. Then I started to travel a lot, so I don't use it. So. Uh, Okay, well, we decided just to make the, the studio is valid for all the young artists in Alexandria. Then we had we found that we had to go through uh, to start to make it more uh, systematic, and we, we we have an open call, then we receive applications, and then we reduce the amount of people to twenty students. So now this is happening now for the third years. For the third year, uh, we invite about 20 students to have studios for seven to eight months. And then we invite a lot, a lot of visitors to give talks. And I found people are extremely generous with me in this sense. Whoever invites me to an exhibition, I invite them back almost to give a talk to the students. And people are really generous, seriously. Uh, wonderful people, okay? From, from all over the world, uh, Documenta came, with all the curators to, that were involved in Documenta to give a seminar in the school for, for one week. 
uh, a symposium. It was a closed symposium actually with the students, and uh, many people came from uh, even Amal Khalaf from Serpentine, and Jana Graham from Serpentine. Uh, people came from New Museum, from MoMA, from everywhere. Uh, and I, I, as much as I can, I try to to send the students to to travel to see also uh, exhibitions somehow. So we also con con connected them with Documenta. So Documenta agreed to have ten students for one month in Castle to help the the artist and to attend all the talks and everything. And that was great uh, educational program for them. Again, we did this with Charles Biennial, and uh, hopefully we're doing this also with Serpentine uh, and with MoMA, and so on. It's, it's going great, really, but also all with the help of wonderful people that we meet everywhere. So I've got one or two last questions, and then maybe we can open it you know, to your questions. Uh, we probably, we've got about 15, 20 more minutes, so let me ask you the two last questions before we open it up. You've realized so many projects already. You've told us now about your two next projects. Do you have kind of utopic projects, dreams, projects for the future? What's going to happen yes. once you've realized the Cabaret Crusades and conclude that chapter, once you've realized al Asar al Matruna? What, what's the unrealized Vajraki? The, the dream is, is to make, after I finish this, is to make a, a series about the Pharaonic history. This is very taboo, actually, for many, many Egyptian artists, including me, because it can be very kitschy and cliche and touristic. But this is, I think it's a challenge. If I can do something with this, it can be perfect, really. Brilliant. And my last question is about the truth being the truth, because I started kind of um, uh, actually late last year at the end of December uh, with my Instagram project. I never really used social networks before. And then I was with Ryan Tricartin in the studio in LA, and he just took my iPhone and downloaded, you know, the thing for Instagram and posted a, a first image and said, you know, Hans Ulrich always joined Instagram, so I had them to kind of do something with it. Uh, and I sort of was thinking a long time what one could do with these, with Instagram and Twitter. And I was kind of thinking, Umberto Eco keeps emphasizing that handwriting disappears, no? And that we live in a context where handwriting gets less and less celebrated. And we also use handwriting less and less. And particularly for a generation of, you know, people growing up with all kinds of digital media, they almost never use handwriting. Um, and so I thought, and Echo said, you know, we need urgent protest in society against the disappearance of handwriting. So I was thinking rather than to lament, you know, we could maybe use these social networks to actually, you know, promote handwriting. And we started this process to actually post on my Instagram and Twitter, you know, every day a handwritten message from an artist. And when I ask you to write a sentence, a kind of a motto, you wrote, the truth is the truth. And I wanted to ask you to explain that to us. Well, I Why it, is the truth the truth? I think I wrote it in Arabic. And in, in Arabic, al-haq, which is the truth, al-haq means God. So God is the truth, or the truth it is the truth. Yes, so it was just, I was just, during this time, maybe I was just thinking with what, what, is, what the, the truth is. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks a lot. For urgent questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a question here. I don't know if you have a mic. Wonderful. Um, I actually have a question for Mr. August. Um, well, I've seen Cabaret Cru uh, Crusades three times within the last year, and somehow what always troubled me was the context it was put into into the art context. And um, so my question is, do you place it into the context because of the artist and his general work or uh, because of the piece of work itself? So why would you um, put it in the gallery context rather than uh, into an educational, historical series on TV? So the question, why we would show it in a museum, you mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there is, it's obviously then leads to a question of why, to why, you know, could he imagine it to be on TV? But I mean, first of all, I think it definitely, you know, is a work one can see again and again. And I've seen, you know, part one maybe, you know, five or six times now, and, you know, part two also several times. And it is, 
a work where I see every time I see it something totally different, you know. And this, in this sense, I think for me, always a criteria when you know we want to see an artwork again and again in all kinds of different temporalities. But the key is not that. The key is that we can see it again and again and again. Similar to a painting, you know, we can visit paintings again and again, and each time, you know, we see something else. For this reason, you know, if it's on. Um, um, you know, if it's in a cinema, that would answer the question why, you know, in a cinema it would be screened once and it would be difficult that then, you know, unless you could obviously imagine, you could imagine somewhere a kind of a chapel where it's screened every day. I mean, that could happen. I mean, like what Ionesco said, you know, a play can be staged every day. So then it maybe could work in a cinema. But then obviously it's the question, could it be on, on TV? And that's a question which I think only Bayer can answer. I mean, in the, in the catalog here, I made two interviews for, uh, you know, for this catalog here of the, um, uh, of the festival, and one with Weil and one with David Lynch. And David Lynch says that he has a horror of his films you know, being shown on, on computers, and he has a horror of his, his films you know, being shown you know, on television. He really wants them to be seen, you know, most of it wants to be seen in, in cinema. So why do you think it could be shown on television? I mean... Uh, okay, I, uh, to be honest, I would not feel very comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe I don't, I don't have the, the courage to, to show them on TV. I really don't have, I feel that it's a, it's a field that I don't know it enough. And even, even when I, when I screen the, the, the film in a cinema, I don't feel very comfortable. I usually prefer to show them as installation as an installation, meaning that they are screened in, I don't want to say a gallery, but in, in a place where people are really free to leave whenever they don't want, they don't like it, they, they just, but to have them on a seat, forced to stay, it's killing me. But uh, I don't know, maybe it's just. Uh, and then there is also, yeah. I mean, one other aspect which is interesting, it's a very interesting question. I mean, there is also the aspect still, again, of you doing these spaces and I love the idea you know of seeing these films in, in your painted spaces and it's interesting I mean today we spoke about the Serpentine show and you started to tell me how important it is to paint the walls and, and to really you know to, to, to build spaces I suppose that's important right I think for important. example even in Documenta it was very clear like every single detail the, 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 the from the carpet to the the exact color of the walls and I think these things are extreme and I'm, I'm very attached to this. So it becomes in the end an installation much more than just a screening uh, in any place. Yeah. Are there other questions? Is there a question here on the left? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit curious of um, hearing you talk a bit more about the labor involved in the making of um, your films, it's amazing production, visually so luscious, but it, it requires a quite exhaustive intellectual uh, research and work. It, does that work is being done only by yourself or you have researchers helping you? Uh, same thing with the production and the making. How does your, your kitchen look like in terms of the making of the work? Yes. Yeah, actually, okay. Um, yes, it needs a lot of people. To help for sure needs a lot of people. Um, what's really great about this work, I can I, I just say said that uh, two days ago. Uh, but I, this is I, I I would say this again in uh, that it's very very one of the most be beautiful parts in in this film. When you when I find myself in in the set inside during this the filming and I see that there is over 70 to 80 person in the studio very professionals and students everyone is really really working hard I am the, and I am the only one in the studio who speaks Arabic and he knows what this film really about and this film is speaking about a bloody period in Europe and all these people, so I made one production in Italy, one production in France, and hopefully the third in Germany. If we manage this, that means these are the, the, three, the three main forces in the Crusades. But it was really, really uh, fascinating that people are really 
uh, putting all this um, uh, effort and sincere work uh, to produce this piece in classical Arabic that is based on the Crusades history from the Arab point of view. I find that this is very, very important. Maybe I find it more important than producing this piece in, in Egypt or one of the Arab countries, actually. Uh, yes, but I worked with, with many, many, many wonderful people, including, for example, the, the, the director of photography that I worked with, uh, uh, Fabrizio Blombara, uh, from, from Italy, uh, and uh, Claudio Cavallari, uh, the, the editor, uh, um, and, and I don't want to just forget names, but many wonderful people that uh, I really think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's enough that they, for me, that they, uh, because, because when you speak about even the, 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 do I have helpers for the research, the intellectual part, maybe not really, because this is something I have to write it myself and I have to, to do it, but to, to realize all these things, to realize all this, uh, to realize the second part with 120 marionettes made out of ceramic, is something extremely difficult. Because to make the mechanism inside this marionette, uh, it's a mechanism also made out of clay. I told them I accept to make it out of any material. It's not shown, but they did not accept. They were like really if. It has to be in clay, we will do it in clay. Although that does not exist even to move the eyes with mechanism made all out of clay, this is uh, crazy, but they made it. So I think really it's, uh, it's about the teamwork, how you collaborate with them, yes. Maybe one last question if there is. If not, I have one very last question. Rainer Maria Rilke wrote this uh, wonderful book, which I keep rereading, which is his you know, advice to a young poet. I was kind of wondering, also in relation to your school, what's, what's the advice you give to young artists? Oh, <laughs> it's very big for me. <laughs> uh, well, I always tell them, I always tell my students, I try not to teach, by the way, in, in Mass Alexandria at all. I, all. I only have it like a platform and I invite people, but I try not to teach. But I usually tell them that the, the mediocre artist believes that art, art, there is a way to make art. And there is a way to learn how to, to make it. But actually, once you make it, it's not art anymore. So it, once you know how to make it, it's not art anymore. This is what I tell my, my students. Bye, thank you very, very thank much. You thank so you much. all so much. Thank you.